keynote speaker for tonight, Dr. James Zumbi. Dr. Zumbi co-founded the Arab American Institute in 1985 and has since served as its president. He is a member of the executive committee of the Democratic National Committee and was appointed by President Obama to the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom in 2013. In addition to writing a weekly column published in 16 countries, Dr. Zogby is the creator and host of the award-winning call-in political television show, Viewpoint, and is frequently featured on national and international media as an expert on Middle Eastern affairs. In 2010, Dr. Zogby published the highly acclaimed book, Arab Voices. His 2013 e-book, Looking at Iran, the Rise and Fall of Iran in Arab Public Opinion, is drawn from his extensive polling across the Middle East with Doc Zogby Research Services. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Zogby. Thank you. Um, I, um, I was here for the last panel. And so what I prepared, I might not use. Because I want to address uh, my comments in the context of the conversation that you just had. Uh, let me begin, if I can, on a personal note with some anecdotes uh, about me and, and my life. Uh, if I, I'm going to be 70 next week. Um, I call that obituary age. That's the age where when you look in the paper and you see the guy died at 70, you say, ah, oh, he had a good life. At, at 68 or 69, it's, oh, he, he was so young. Um, so despite that, though, um, if your parents are from the Middle East, I'm your generation. If you are born in the Middle East and an immigrant here, um, think of me as your children. Because my experiences, as much as I heard that was different, it's my story too. It's my story too. Um, my dad came in 1923. Uh, he was undocumented. The term of art is he was illegal. Um, Syrians, what we were called at the time, uh, had been excluded. We were part of the Asian Exclusion Act. Uh, Senator David Reed from Pennsylvania, who included us in that, called us Syrian trash in the Senate. And we were zeroed out in the census. My dad being an enterprising uh, young Lebanese guy with his whole family here, and he was the one left behind did what any enterprising guy would do. He got a job on a ship from Marseille, stowed away when he got to New York, got off the boat, never looked back. He was in hiding for about 10 years. Um, he would work with his brothers, and then he'd have to go into hiding when the, the federal agents would come around. Uh, there was an amnesty passed in the mid-30s, and he got his naturalization in 1942. You noted in your introduction that the president appointed me um, to a commission. I have my parchment, they call it, on my wall. Um, and underneath it is my father's naturalization paper. It's an American story. When I nominated Jesse Jackson, I was one of the people asked to nominate him for president of the United States in 1984 when he ran for president. That, that wonderful speech he gave. Um, I got to nominate him and I opened my comments with, I'm the son of an illegal immigrant. I'm going to nominate for president the great grandson of a slave. Only in America can that happen. And that's the reality. There is a... Because if you were illegal in any Arab country, you will always be illegal. And your kids will always be illegal. And you do not have the opportunity to rise above that. There is a dark side to America. We can never forget it. 
Because if we forget it, we become prone to being victims of that dark side. But there's also another side to America, and we must never forget that, because if we forget that, then we lose the promise and the possibility of overcoming that dark side and making advances, which we have made as a community and as an American people. These two, do you remember the cartoon strip Tweety Bird and Sylvester? Right? They had the, the good guy and the bad guy on each. Uh, America has both its dark side and its, its light side speaking to it all the time. Our job, as, as Nadim and others said when they were talking, is to build that coalition of the light side to speak with us and for us. We found our feet, our footsteps in American politics in the Jackson campaign. It was our time had come. And I'll tell you about that in just a minute, but I want to make another point about this same sort of reshaping the narrative. I was invited to speak at a State Department conference uh, several years ago. It was a conference for diaspora Americans, it was called. I said, what the hell is that? What diaspora American? <laughs> Secretary Clinton got up in the beginning and she welcomed us as first and second generation diaspora Americans. I had told them before when they invited me I didn't want to speak at it because I'm not living in diaspora. I'm not an Arab living in the West. I'm an American, damn it. I fought hard to be an American. And I wanted to be recognized as a full citizen of this country. I'm not the me in America. I'm a citizen. And I, I demand that. When we talk about recasting the narrative, that's what it is about. It's about saying that America has to respect us as equal partners in the building of this republic because there is no America without all of us. I mean, the, the notion of the Pat Buchanans or the, the whatever, the, the, the xenophobes and the Islamophobes and the nativists is nonsense. No ethnic group defines America. They did that. They tried that. They said it about Poles, they said it about Irish, they said it about Italians, they said it about Jews. What does it mean to be an American? What is American culture? What is American music? What is American dance? What's American humor? If it doesn't talk about black culture and Jewish and Yiddish culture and Polish and Italian culture and now Arab culture. We are part of shaping the narrative of America and America doesn't exist without us. That's the sense we must have. So I got up and I spoke at the thing and I said, I'm not, a, I'm not a living diaspora. If I were today to get a job in Abu Dhabi, I would be living in diaspora. I'd be an expatriate over there. Actually, it's funny. I went to a grocery store in, um, in, in, in Abu Dhabi. I went to a grocery store in Abu Dhabi and it blew my mind. My dad had a little grocery store, as many Lebanese do or did. And, um, and I used to do the produce for them. And so the first thing I always do when I go into a grocery store is I look at the produce section. This place blew my damn mind. It was like I walked out and said, things I'd never seen before, vegetables and fruits and things. I didn't know what to do with them if you bought them. They were like interesting looking things and people from everywhere around the world were buying them and stuff. I didn't know what to do. My wife and I were living there for three weeks. I was teaching at NYU has a, a campus there. I did a J term. Um, and I'm like marveling at the diversity of the people and the diversity of the products in the store. And then I saw an ethnic aisle. And I said to my wife, holy shit, what's ethnic? What, what, is it, what does this mean? I walked there, guess what it was? It was mustard and mayonnaise and ketchup <laughs> and pickles. And they had hamburger buns and hot dog buns. I said, wow, we're ethnic here. This is really cool. Um, we can teach them our cuisine, <laughs> making popcorn and stuff. It was, it was really, really interesting. But no, I'm not living in diaspora. I'm an American. And so I got up and I, I introduced myself. I, I, when it was my turn to speak, I got up at the podium at the State Department and I said that. I'm not living in diaspora. I'm an American citizen. My father was an immigrant. He didn't come here so that I would be first generation living in diaspora. I got a standing ovation from people there. So I turned to the secretary and they said, that's why they came. They came as Americans to participate in a discussion of how we can help abroad, countries abroad, countries that our parents or that we came from, but that are not ours anymore. This is our country. We want it to be smarter. We want it to be better. We don't want it to be stupid when it deals with problems all over the world. And we want to contribute what we've learned in America to help the world become a better place.
and we want to help this country become a better place because the Lord knows it needs it. Um, I don't think they got it, but I keep fighting that fight. So we founded the Institute 30 years ago. Um, and so we went back to Dearborn, Michigan uh, for our National Leadership Conference this year. We did it in Dearborn, the appropriate place, because in many ways Dearborn was our, our start. It was the place that sort of brought us into politics in an interesting way. The, the Institute started out of the, out of the Jackson campaign, to be exact. Um, we were one of the products of the rainbow. Um, Jesse had come to me in 1983 and asked me to be his deputy campaign manager, and I said um, that I'd spent the last four years organizing Arab Americans, and I didn't think I could stop at this point. And he said, you're going to do more for your community in the next four months than you did in the last four years. And he was right. As we went from city to city, the excitement that it generated, the the, the voter registration drives that it produced, the fundraising that, that happened, really was amazing to, to see the, the reactions. And so um, when we came out of the campaign, um, a couple of us said, we have to institutionalize this. We have to build this dynamic and have it grow uh, and make it a permanent feature in our, in our community because politics, as much as it's discredited in some quarters, is the key to empowerment. You can't get everything you want through politics, but there's a whole lot you can get if you use it effectively. And our story as a community is different than almost every other ethnic community in, in America. Um, if you look at how Irish and Italians and Poles and others, urban ethnic communities, uh, how they advanced in America, they did it through politics. They built political machines, and they act, you know, when I used to, it used to be funny, I'd go talk to the grocers in Cleveland or in Chicago or whatever, and I'd talk about, no, 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 we don't do politics, we do business. And I'd say, yeah, but the biggest business in Chicago is politics. <laughs> the biggest business in Cleveland is politics. They get more contracts, they do more business. Actually, with the guys building the road out here in, on, on, uh, on, 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 you know, in front of the shops in, Cle in, in, in Chicago, they get vouchers from the city to buy lunch. They don't come to your stores because they don't, you don't have access to politics to have an in with city government to get that. You need zoning problems solved. You don't have access to city government to get those zoning issues resolved. You want to get a license. You don't have the access to city government to get the license. We succeeded unlike most other communities, without politics. We did it on our own as individuals. Now, there's a good side to that. There's also the bad side to it, because in many ways, it produced a kind of a disempowering process. We felt we didn't need politics, and so we didn't use politics, and the result was we were, uh, we were disempowered. We got as far as we could get. We, we actually could go no further. We succeeded. We did this, we do this thing, if you look on our website, um, aaiusa.org, you'll see we have this Casey Kasem brochure. Casey came to me years ago and said, I hope you know Casey, I, I find as I get older, I talk about things. I was teaching a little while ago, I used a Seinfeld, because I think Seinfeld is life, actually. Um, there's almost nothing that happens to me that I don't say that reminds me of the episode when George did. But, and I found that students in the class said, who is he? I was like, I. I was speechless. I, was, I said, I have nothing to say to you anymore. I said, I don't know what, don't know what to do. Um, but um, where was I? Casey Kasem. Casey Kasem came, called me and he said, you know, I do America's top 40. I want to do the top 40 Arab Americans. So we put together a brochure. And we've, every year we edit it. The number's gotten much larger than 40. Um, and it's really fun when, when people get, it's actually fun for others. After 9-11, it was the biggest seller we had. I mean, the, the, the National Education Association, the American Federation of Teachers, the Justice Department Community Relations Division, all of them asked for reprint rights. Millions of this thing were produced and it just keeps growing and growing and growing. It's still the number one thing visited on our website. It has all the famous Arab Americans. It was, famous, it was important for other people to see it. But, it was important for us to see it, to know who the Arab American fashion designers are, or the Arab American business people, or the Arab American generals in the military, or the Arab American political leaders, etc. were. People didn't know that. And, and yet it's there. So Casey helped us put that together. And, um, and it created a sense of, 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 of a different kind of empowerment. But all of them did it on their own. 
We were determined to do something to create a vehicle to empower the community as a whole. And so we put this together thinking that in 1985 we'd launched it and then we would be ready for the 88 presidential election. That was our goal, focus on 88. April, we opened in March. In April, I got a call from Dearborn. There was an election in Dearborn. The guy running for mayor was running on the platform what to do about the Arab problem. And the Arab problem was Dearborn had 93,000 people, 18,500 of them were Arab. And he said, they're ruining our darn good way of life. They have their foreign language, their foreign ways, their kids aren't behaving, and blah, 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 blah. All the crap that gets said about immigrants all the time. We went to Dearborn. We got the voter rolls to see what we could do in the election. Guess what? We had 700 registered voters. I thought to myself, son of a bitch is smart. He's smart. He's got 18,000 people. Only 700 of them are registered to vote. Why not use them as a foil? Why not use them as a threat? They can't hurt them. They couldn't help them. So he put the rest of the community against the Arabs, and he won. Flash forward, 1996, we did voter registration drives, et cetera. I go to Dearborn for our leadership conference that year. The, that same guy was mayor. He gives me the mespaha of the city. He had made the mespaha of the city. He didn't give the key anymore. He had these things specially made in Lebanon. Um, and he opens his thing with a couple of quotes from the Quran speaks about my dear brothers and sisters. With me at the event was Bob Nash, who was personnel director at the Clinton White House, uh, African-American who'd been with Clinton from when you know, his first term as governor. Um, Bob Nash leans over to me. I told him the story about this guy. He leans over to me and says, son of a bitch can count. <laughs> um, and the point was that when you count, you count. When you add up, you count. You don't get discriminated against in Dearborn because you count. There are too many at this point. And so when we went for a 30th anniversary and we were in Dearborn, the president of the city council was there, Arab American woman. Four of the seven members of the city council of Dearborn, Arab Americans. Three of the five judges in that county, Arab American. And they now have 20,000 registered voters. They are the political power in Southeast Michigan. You don't run even on a national election in Michigan without going to Arab Americans. And we're doing the same thing in New Jersey and Patterson. Same kind of process is happening. Unfortunately, we're gonna have an Arab American running against an Arab American. But the fact is, is that that's what the process is about. It's about empowering the community. And it's happening in other cities as well. Places in California where we never had that kind of political movement. We now have people who are the co-chairs of their county party. In eight, nine states, Arab Americans sit on the state committee, in the, the executive committee in the state parties. We have a network of 400 Arab American elected officials all over the country. And they're doing great things. And they identify with the community in ways that they never did before. Back before we started this process, 30, 40 years ago, there was a Carter, had a committee, a Syrian Lebanese for Carter. Reagan had a Lebanese committee for Reagan. Arab Americans had never been organized on a national level and been recognized as an ethnic community. And they are today. Actually, in the Democratic Party, when you fill out the form of what you are in the, as a delegate for, for counting them, they have an Arab American category. Now that's not a little thing, it's a big thing. When you fought to be recognized and you get recognized, it's a big thing. You pocket that victory and you move on to the next one. You don't dismiss it as irrelevant. When in 1988, I went back with the Jackson campaign and to um, the Democratic Convention in Atlanta, um, it was a knockdown drag out fight because we didn't just go as Arab Americans, we went with a platform plank on Palestinian statehood. Oh man, they went berserk. You can't do it, you're gonna destroy the Democratic Party. If you even get up there and mention the word. Jesse stood by me, we had the fight, we had 1,500 delegates on the floor, Palestine lives banners and stuff like that. We felt it was important in the middle of the Intifada to have a national discussion about the Middle East. You can't, you can't not have a discussion about the Middle East. And so we insisted on it, and we did it. 
we lost. We lost the vote. We lost the vote because we actually decided not to have a vote because we knew it would be fracturous even within the Jackson Coalition, the political pressure. We weren't ready. I mean, another thing about fighting is to know when to not fight. It's to fight, but know when not to fight. We chose at that point to make the point. We went to the podium of the convention. We had the debate. We had the floor demonstration. We drove the other side absolutely bonkers. And then we said, OK, that's enough. And we pulled back. Uh, guess what? Didn't hurt us at all. Democratic Party, if I, still around. Actually, I chair the Resolutions Committee of the Democratic Party, which is cute because all those people who were on the Dukakis side who said I destroy the party, I tell them anytime they want to introduce a resolution, just let me know. I'd be happy to consider it. You know, <laughs> it's real nice. Um, and now we're having a war with the Center for American Progress, the Hillary Clinton's operation in Washington, because they're inviting Benjamin Netanyahu, which is stupid. It's stupid. The person who killed peace. They're inviting him in order to let him brandish his credentials back in Israel that, you see, I'm still the master of America. I can manipulate both sides. It doesn't mean when you start to win that you give up your principles. You keep your principles. But you have to balance your principles with being relevant at the same time. It's, it's, it's the need to be a part of a process, but be part of the process and be respected for the position you bring into the process. If you simply become like everybody else, then there's no point in you even being there. The point is that we launched it, we, we advanced, and the community actually overcame many of the internal and external problems that we faced. They were many. There's a generational difference. There's the third generation folk who, they kind of, you know, not sure they even need this stuff, you know? Um, kind of like, you know, they, they um, I don't want to get associated with you people. You know, it's the same problem that existed in the Jewish community. When the, the Jewish community was in this country the turn of the last century up to 1920 or so, they were doing very well at some point. And then all of a sudden these East European Jews started to come over and they, they, they scorned them. They said, we'd want to be associated with them. And so they did not bring them in. The American Jewish Congress was born out of the fact that you could not ignore the recent immigrants who were different and you thought were going to drag you down. And so they, they had an, an effort to kind of create a new structure. Well, we're sensitive to that because the, we have many generations, many wings in our community. We have the generation that is three, three generations here in the country. We have the very recent immigrant generation. We have Christian, we have Muslim, we have people from um, the, the, the older crowd who were Syrian Lebanese and newer crowds who are Syrian Lebanese, they're still the dominant group. Those two groups are the dominant groups. But we also today have North Africans that we never had before because of the lottery system. Huge numbers of Moroccans and Tunisians and and Algerians coming in, Mauritanians. I call the Mauritanian Mafia in Washington. It's wonderful. There's a small group of guys that came over about 20 years ago. That's it. That's it. And today they have limousine services. I mean, the, 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 it, it's funny. I had a funny experience at the White House. We were beating on Bill Clinton for not appointing people to the administration, Arab Americans. Because one of the things we do at the Institute is we sort of lobby to get people hired in administration job, administrative jobs. And he was be resistant uh, you know, on a couple the applications we had. So I went downstairs after the meeting with him, and we had a, there was a reception. Some he says, uh, you're Jim Zogby. I said, yeah. He said, he introduces himself to me, and he says, I'm from Mauritania. I said, oh, that's nice. That's nice, man. He said, let me introduce you to some of the brothers who are here, too. He brings me over. There's a Moroccan guy and a Tunisian guy. So a little later, the president came down. I said, oh, it's Mr. President, you do have Arab Americans working in the White House. And I introduced him to him, and I said to him, I said, that's nice, but that's not what I mean. <laughs> That's not what I mean. Um, but the fact is, those guys today own limousine services, they own restaurants, they own... The, the, the progression, the way our community advances is extraordinary. Just one, one side story about, about the Yemeni community in, uh, in California. When we opened our first ADC office, the Anti-Discrimination Committee, I founded that one in 1980. I went out to LA to raise some money uh, for the, 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 the ADC. 
And somebody told me, this is nice, this Hollywood stuff, but you got Yemeni farm workers in California. It's terrible what's being done to them. They don't, they're not organized by the union. There's the, the state agriculture labor relations board doesn't have Arabic speakers. These guys are destitute. Nobody's doing anything for them. So I went out uh, with Alex Oda. You might remember the name. He was the guy who got murdered by, um, by the JDL. Alex and I flew out to uh, uh, Bakersfield, and sure enough, 7,000 Yemeni farm workers. Out of 30, 33,000 Latino farm workers, 7,000 Yemeni. It was a huge number, huge number. And, uh, and they were destitute. They didn't have anything. So we raised money, we opened an office. Unfortunately, we had to open two offices because the North Yemenis and the South Yemenis wouldn't go to the same office, but uh, that's uh, you know, another story. Anyway, so we, 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 we moved it, and they did really well. And then I left ADC in 80, 85 and started the institute. And in 1989, Jesse Jackson called me because Dolores Huerta, who was the head of the Farm Workers Union at the time, wanted to restart the great boycott. And she thought it would be a great idea if they could get the Arab store owners in San Francisco to help by boycotting grapes. And so she called Jesse to see if she, he'd call me to do that. So I said, I'll make a deal. If she organizes the Yemeni farm workers, I'll do the, the grapes. Oh, it's a fair, fair, fair thing. So he called her up. And then he called me back a half hour later. He said, there are no more Yemeni farm workers. There's like 400 of them. They do the specialty stuff. They do the pruning of trees, and they do asparagus, just the, the sort of specialty stuff. I said, where do they all go? So we went out, and we asked some people around. They owned, about, at that point, about 2,800 small businesses in the state of California. They'd been in the field for 20 years. That was enough. They put nickels and dimes together, and they opened small businesses. And now one of the thriving groups that we deal with out there is the Yemeni Young Professional Association. The trajectory of our community for every wave is exactly the same. They start doing what they have to do to survive, and within a generation, their kids are going to college, and they're moving forward. And that's what we need to build on, that expertise, that ability we have to advance Economically, we have to advance not just economically and socially, but also politically. And to put that to work to become a political force for the community, for the community. We should not be having the problems that we're having today. But did you ever see the movie, The Inconvenient Truth, Al Gore's film about the uh, climate change? Now, there are probably some Republicans here who think it's all a big myth and there's no science behind it. But if you just bear with me in the film, there's an interesting point that Gore makes where he shows that, yeah, the temperatures go down one year and up another year. But if you look at it over a long period of time, it's going this way. So that, yes, there's ebbs and flows, but it's going that way. That's the story of our community and most communities in America as well. Yes, there are periods where we have difficult. My life was threatened. I got firebombed the first time in 1980. They firebombed the Palestine Human Rights Campaign. Three guys went to jail after 9-11 for threatening my life. We had tons of problems before 9-11. Actually, what happened with 9-11 was that for the first time, they actually found and prosecuted people who hurt us. They didn't do that before. The fact is, in other words, that the problems are greater but our capacity to deal with the problems are greater. If 9-11 had happened and we did not have the capacity that we have built, the allies that we have earned, the relationships that we have forged, we would have been buried after 9-11. Make no mistake about it, we never would have survived as a community. But I found myself one week after 9-11 standing in the middle of the Japanese American War Memorial. If you've never been to it, you need to go to it. It's a little place in Washington off of the Congress, right off the side of the Congress. It's a little very quiet garden that has the names of all the concentration camps where Japanese were brought. And the fear, if you recall, was that that might happen to us. That was the fear. But I went there that day, because they invited me to be the, the, the keynote speaker then. And I stood there, 33 organizations co-sponsored it. Chair of the Democratic Party was there. Three senators were there. Seven members of Congress were there. Heads of most of the Protestant churches and the Bishop of Washington was there. And all of these other organizations, the Japanese, the Chinese, the, all of the different organizations that I could think of were there. And as I started to speak, I said, that will not happen to us. It could not happen to us. Yeah, we're going to get a lot of crap. And yes, we're going to pay a big price. And yes, a lot of people are being hurt. But we have the ability to withstand it because unlike Japanese at the time of World War II, when no one 
defended them. We had, as great as the challenge was, we had earned the ability to respond to that challenge with allies who were going to defend us. And they did. And they did. And so the, 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 the point I want to make to you is that we have these challenges, but we have an ability to deal with them. And even when, look, I mean, one of the, one of the big issues that we've always had to deal with is that when it comes to an Arab community, we have some issue concerns that are not very, I'm being euphemistic here, that are not very popular with some groups in America, a couple groups in America. And unlike many other ethnic groups, I mean, who have to deal with internal problems, you know, we, we always think we have all these internal problems, oh, it's terrible, you know, we can't get this side to agree with that side. Go to a Ukrainian meeting sometime. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy, it's like one country and they can't talk to each other. The Armenians have the same problem. I mean, every I love it. I chair the Ethnic Council in Washington, and I love it when they come up to me and they say, we wish we were as organized as your community. <laughs> one, thing I've learned, one thing I've learned is that we're actually better than most people in our community think we are. We've actually done more than we recognize that we've done. People say to me all the time, well, yeah, you, you're just talking like the glass is half full instead of half empty. I say, no, I remember when we didn't have a glass. <laughs> I remember when we didn't have a glass. And the fact is that we are today in a position that is envied by many other groups because of what we've been able to do. And we should never forget that. Never forget that. I don't just keep that thing on my wall with my dad just because it makes me feel good. But it tells me a story of perseverance and a story of advancement that is true not just for me, but it's true for countless numbers of people in our community all over the country. Donna Shalala, when I told the story of being a, 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 my father being undocumented, she said, mine was too. And at the same event was former Congresswoman Mary Rose Okar, and she said, yeah, and my father was too. I mean, that is a story that is a common story for our people. We overcame adversity and we succeeded. The question is, can we do it collectively? That's the question. And that's the problem we face, not just because pro-Israel groups want to want to bury us, or because the religious right wants to bury us, or because the xenophobes want to bury us. It's also true because we have problems internally. But there is some things that make me feel hopeful. And that is that for many of us, in, in particular for my generation, which is your kid's generation, if you're uh, an, uh, somebody not born here, is that it doesn't matter. I had a Lebanese ambassador come to my office one time. It was kind of funny. He'd come to introduce himself, and he sat in my office, and he said, how do you organize yourself? I said, well, I've got the organizing unit over there, and the research unit's over there, and then the uh, administration is over. He said, no, no, no. How do you organize your staff? I said, by function? He said, no, 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 no. No, like that guy out at the front desk, Rami. He's Shia from Lebanon, huh? I said, I actually don't know. I never asked him. There's no place on the form when we hire him to say, what country and religion are you from? He's just an Arab American to me. I'm of that generation that my kids laugh at me. I watch the movies at the end. I won't leave until the movie is completely done and the thing is, I say, oh look, the dolly grip. He's an Arab. <laughs> and they say, it's a, to me, I, I know that your dad does that too, right? I, it's, it means something to me to see our people advancing and to not care what religion he is or what country he's from. We had Rashida Tlaib in Michigan. She's Muslim. She's Palestinian. I didn't even know it that she was Palestinian. I just thought everybody from Michigan is Lebanese, but, but I mean, in Dearborn in particular, I mean, for God's sake. But I get there, you know, we did, everybody in the community mobilized around her. And this young guy just down in Houston, he lost his election for city council in Houston. It was a big deal, an at-large race. It was a huge effort on his part. Philippe Nassif, obviously Lebanese, half Mexican, he lost. But people, every persuasion, religion, every national group in the community supported him. We had two years ago at Gibran, we gave a, every year we give a Najib Halabi Award. Najib Halabi was the father of Queen Noor, and he was the first Arab American in a high level post in an administration, served in the Kennedy administration. He was a great man. He became national chair of uh, Save the Children 
uh, for many, many years. Uh, you, you, you may have remembered him, but if you didn't, he was a remarkable man. When he passed away, we decided to start a, an award for public service in his name. So one year we gave it to a guy, uh, Katouf, who had been ambassador to Syria, ambassador to UAE, and longtime um, State Department career guy. And the person who gave the award was Ray LaHood, the, who at the time was Secretary of Commerce. And it didn't occur to me until the very end, and I thought I just would share, because a lot of the ambassadors were there, and they were always lecturing me on, you people need to work together. Why can't the Arabs work together? And I always say to them, don't give me that crap, because you can't work together. We're doing a lot better than you. And um, so I got up, and I said, guess what we did tonight? We had an award named after a Syrian-American that was given to a Palestinian-American and was presented to him by a Lebanese American. You couldn't do that in the Arab world. You wouldn't even think of doing that in the Arab world. And guess what? Most of you didn't even know, I bet, the, the background of these three men. It didn't matter to, to us. <coughs> so these internal differences that we still face, and to some degree, Arab Spring sort of exacerbated them. But I went through the Civil War in Lebanon. I went through the post-Camp David era when people would say, we don't want the Egyptians coming to the event because they sold us out. Or in, during the Lebanese war when everybody was conscious of who was on what side. And now we're seeing the same thing play out. We have to fight against that. We cannot allow our community to be divided. Jesse Jackson used to say, do not import the stuff from the Middle East. Export what you've learned in America. You have more to offer them than they have to offer you. And that's something I believe quite seriously. We have something that we can offer in terms of value, in terms of expertise. I went to an event after the Arab String Egyptian Americans. It was a huge event, like 700 guys in, um, in uh, Northern Virginia. I didn't know there were that many Egyptians in Northern Virginia, but there were. And they were there, and they were all talking about what were they were going to do about Egypt after the revolution and whatever. It was really exciting, and I was so pleased to be there. And they asked me to be the speaker, and I got up to speak after hearing a number of these panels. And the, the problem with the damn panels was that they were all focused on voting in the election, in the Egyptian election. I got up afterwards, I said, they don't need your votes. They got 80 million people that are gonna vote. <laughs> and number two, whoever you vote for, you're not gonna have to live with the consequences of that election. That's not your election, that's their election. What can you do for Egypt? You can invest and create jobs. Egypt needs more jobs than it needs votes. You can help be a force for change in Egypt by projecting what you've learned in America to Egypt. Egypt needs respect for human rights. It needs respect for civil rights. It needs respect for citizenship rights. That's what they need, and we can teach that. We're better teachers of that than some stupid NGO from Washington that goes to do it because we go with an authenticity of being part of that people that have learned lessons that we can help project. Rather than import their stuff, we need to export to them. And the first thing, and the most important thing we can export is not just our values, but it's our expertise and it's our investment. They need jobs. They need the creativity. I mean, our Silicon Valley guys, we've got guys in Silicon Valley doing brilliant stuff from our community. That's the kind of technology that we can export. And there are groups actually doing it. There's TechWadi, I mean, groups that are really doing some fascinating stuff. And they're the people that we need to shine a light on. And they can empower people in the Middle East in a way that nobody else can, because they can help create a new future for a new generation. And there's another divide that we have to deal with, and that's the religion divide, which is cropping up all the time. Look, I am a Maronite. Duh. I mean, <laughs> a lot of people know that. but. I'm not one of those Maronites, I'm here. <laughs> and um, so when the president appointed me to the Commission on International Religion, I have a PhD in Islam. It's a weird combination. <laughs> um, when the president appointed me, there were Muslim groups who said, that's not right, he's Christian. That is not what we do as a community. We do not do that to each other. We cannot divide ourselves on that basis, because that is also importing crap from the Middle East that we do not need.
And so the issue is that if you're going to be a community, you have to function as a community, and you have to recognize that you have to keep all the parts of the community together, and everybody has the feeling of being invested in it and making it matter for them. Somebody, everybody's got to have something in it, you know? And, and I, I, I'm proud of the fact that what we've been able to do. We've, a couple hundred kids have come to Washington to work with us over the last 30 years. And it's been absolutely exciting. I mean, now we bring together the AI alum. We've got folks who are ambassadors who have been, been through our shop. We have folks who are, are special envoys working at the State Department. I, about 20-something years ago, we were having a problem with FBI surveillance. Like, that's a new problem. It's not. It's an old problem. And so we went to the Justice Department, we complained, and they created an interagency task force. Um, and they brought together all of the different agencies of government, and we'd had a monthly meeting. <clears throat> we solved some problems, and many problems we didn't solve, but we did solve some problems. We actually were able to resolve the issue of secret evidence back then. We were able to resolve the issue of airport profiling, subjective profiling, not the kind that happens now, but the kind where even before you got to the ticket counter, if you were a woman in the job, they stopped you and they emptied your suitcase out on the floor. They were humiliating people, and we got them to stop that. But that interagency task force died. And then it got restarted again uh, after 9-11, and because there was actually one good guy over in the Justice Department who helped us get it go going. Um, and it continued. When the Obama administration came in, they started it up again. And I went to the first meeting, and it was striking to me as the people went around. There were 40 of them there from all the different agencies. And people were introducing, all the Arab American groups were there, and they were introducing themselves. You know, the ADC people were there, and the Muslim advocates were there, and the Muslim pub public affair, you know, and the us and access from Michigan, and then the uh, Arab American professionals, whatever. All these different groups were there. And then the agency group started introducing themselves. Maybe half of them were people of Arab descent, working in the different agencies in government. So they asked me to speak first because I'd been the guy who'd been there from the beginning. And I said, you keep this up, we're not going to have to have meetings anymore. But we do, obviously. It was a joke because we have to keep beating on them. <laughs> but the fact is, is that young Arab Americans are finding their place. When I came to Washington in 1970, seven with the Palestine Human Rights Campaign, there were four Arab Americans working in politics in different organizations. Three of us were in Arab American organizations, and one was working at the ACLU as a secretary. Amnesty International wouldn't hire an Arab American, and they wouldn't take on Arab American, they wouldn't take Palestine on, only Amnesty London took Palestine on. They wouldn't do it here because it was too controversial for them. Today, in Washington, half the staff of most of the human rights groups that deal with Middle East issues are people of Arab descent. The, the immigrant right groups are Arab American. ACLU has more Arab American lawyers on staff, I think, than many law firms do. Um, and it goes on and on. The fact is that there is an, an empowerment of the community that has to be networked. And that's one of the things we try to do, is to bring them together so that they can share information and help advance issues. For example, right now we're dealing with a huge issue on the question of Syrian, uh, Syrian immigrants coming to America. Big xenophobic thing. We don't want them here. It's, an, it's partly Islamophobic. It's partly they don't want anybody here. Um, we had a conference out in Michigan on that. We spent a day on the refugee issue. And we found about six different young Arab American lawyers working in different agencies. They're coming together as a task force to put together a policy paper on how you can fix the immigration system on this particular issue. Because a lot of these things are administrative fixes. It can be done if a community is organized and empowered. And uh, we have problems. I don't doubt those problems. But we also have the capacity to solve those problems. And that's something that we didn't have 30 years ago. I mean, the work in New York that Debbie was talking about, I mean, we, it's not new to have problems in New York. <laughs> What's new is that we have organizations in New York that can deal with those problems. We have allies in New York who can work with us to deal with those problems. Whenever they do something bad to us, we can get three good days of press out of it. And it's pox on their house, not on ours. And that is progress, whether you know it or not, it is, because in the past, when the crap happened to us, it happened silently, and no one knew, and no one cared. No reporter covered the story because it wasn't interesting. But if a death threat comes to an Arab American now, it's a story. 
If the police do bad things to us, it's a story. That poor little kid down in Texas, that became a huge national story. That is progress for the entire community. And it's the result of the work of hundreds of thousands of people to advance and to grow. Look, one last issue and they're telling me time's up. I'm sorry, once I start, I, do, I don't know. What <laughs> Um, it's your fault, though. The panel was so interesting, I had to sort of got de deviated from my, 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 my written remarks. Um, and that's the Middle East. It, it is, talk about challenges we face. We, we do have challenges in civil liberties. America isn't true to its own, its own projected values. When we talk in Arab dialogue, Arab-American dialogues, and we talk with people over there, we talk about our, our values. They look at us and they say, bullshit. You know, what values? Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo? I mean, the fact is we, um, Arab Americans have the capacity to challenge our government and to tell them if you want to be true to the value system you claim, then you better listen to us. We have to make America smarter. We have to make America better. We have to make America true to itself. And one of the places to start is on the Middle East, on the general Middle East issue. Look. Republicans, I mean, for God's sake, it's not that I'm a Democrat, but it's an embarrassment. My brother says America needs a third party, a Republican party. I mean, this group of guys are off the deep end. They really are. And even the guys who are considered the sane ones are a little screw loose because they listen to the insane ones. But, but on the Democratic side, on the Democratic side, Rachel Maddow had a, a Democrat forum last night. I don't know if you watched it. It was two hours long. One question about the Middle East, and it was about whether there should be boots on the ground in Syria. That was it. Since the end of Vietnam, since the end of Vietnam, we have sent more money, sent more weapons, sent more troops, fought more wars, lost more lives, have more national interests at stake, have used more American political capital, and have been a bigger embarrassment in that region than anywhere else in the whole world, and yet we don't even talk about it. You have guys running for president, And I use the word guy as a cross-gender term. Um, men and women running for president who either are ignorant, are willed ignorant, or are ideologues <laughs> without any sense of what to do. And we cannot sit as Americans and let our country elect another person or go through another election process where people are promising to do nothing more than what we've been doing because there are lives at stake, not just lives in the Middle East, but our lives as well. <clears throat> and so we have a challenge as a community, talk about changing the narrative, we have to change the narrative of making America smarter so that they don't put our damn lives at risk when they do stupid stuff, which they do a lot of. <laughs> and just think if any one of these goons gets elected, well, I mean, Hillary Clinton, like John McCain, will be sending troops everywhere. I'm a Democrat, but I'll say it. <laughs> we have to become a political force that builds allies who understand the risk to America of being stupid in the Middle East. We've been doing, Benjamin Netanyahu is coming to town this week, being hosted at the Center for American Progress. It's supposed to be the progressive think tank. Nonsense, nonsense. It is wrong, it's embarrassing. He has been humiliating America for 20 years, and we, he plays us for fools, and we play the part well. We play the part well. And so the issue is we have to do better, and we have to do more. And so I'm very pleased to come here tonight, and thank you. Listen, follow us on Twitter at AAIUSA. You can see all our stuff, I'd love to have and write to me. Anybody that writes to me, I always write back. If you have any questions that I didn't get to answer, uh, is there time for questions? Yeah. Two more questions, okay, sorry. Oh, two questions, period. Anybody? You can take whoever you like. Uh, way in the back, right there. Yes, you. And one more, while the, anybody here? Closer? That guy over here. It better be a good one. <laughs> and don't do an Arab question. You know, I, I did this TV show for 18 years. Arabs have a way of asking and answering at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> they say, they say, don't you think that, 
you know what I think, and then they go on. No, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yes? Um, I just want to say, um, as a Moroccan American, when I talk about the way that he was speaking, I was a Moroccan American who was given both of his citizenships, um, what I would call in a fairly easy way. I come from a very different perspective than yours, both my parents. I would say that to struggle for their um, citizenship. So, this is just to say that I'm coming from a very different perspective. Why, to me, when you say um, the, this question of exporting rather than importing, and we have more to offer them rather than they have to offer us, I just want to talk about the. Uh, originally, I oppose this idea because it seems to be very um, perhaps Western centric and speaks to um, colonialism. And so I, I realize that you're, what you're saying is a lot more complex than this, and you're not speaking about white people going back to um, the countries that perhaps they have imposed um, colonialist regimes on, but rather Arab Americans going back. So I feel like this is a very, very complex idea of Arab Americans going back to their country of origin. And I just feel like this is a much... Let me, let me stop you because I, I, th I get your point, and, I, and I'm, I'm not talking about it in a patronizing way. What I'm saying is that when I sit with a group of people of Arab descent and they talk about you know, for example, voting in the next Egyptian election, or it was dumb. The Iraqi had election, right, took place. And I was reading in the newspaper when that election, the first one took place, and they quote a guy in Southern California who said it was the proudest day of his life for the first time he's going to get to vote. I knew the guy. He was the vice chair of the San Diego County Republican Party. If he had never voted before, what the hell was he doing, chair of the Republican Party of San Diego? Of course he'd voted before. Of course he had voted before. What was he doing? I have Lebanese, every time I go to the Lebanese embassy in the old days, when I'd go for a visa, they'd say, oh, we can make you a citizen. You, you should, we need you. Meaning they needed Maronites. I have none of that. My dad came here, not so that I'd vote there, so that I'd beef up the numbers on one side to help because I'm going to be voting in an election that I have not. Now, can I do something for Lebanon? Yeah, I can. I care about Lebanon a lot. I want to change American policy toward Lebanon. Lebanon needs to change too. But, <laughs> but, but the point is that what my point is is that if we're going to offer anything in terms of building bridges, it can't be where we become surrogates for them. They have their own voices. They have their own leaders. They have their own elections. If we can't change American policy toward them, we have no business trying to change their policy for the people who live there unless we're going to live with the consequences and move back there. That's my point. And so it's not being arrogant or patronizing. It's actually saying be responsible where you're responsible. And if you can't be responsible here and own up to it, then you got no business in this game. That, 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 that's my point, OK? And, and over here? Yeah? Yes. So my question is on Syria. Um, what do you think the U.S. has to offer? Um, and what do you think Arab Americans um, should do to, you know, to push this forward? Well, that's an easy one. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you. I, I, um, I've been writing about Syria um, from the very beginning. And fr from the experience of Lebanon, I concluded there would never be a victory or vanquished. This is not going to end with somebody saying uncle, or Ammu, or Khalu, or whatever, you know. <laughs> it, 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 um, um, there needed to be a negotiated settlement, but everybody was busy pouring gasoline on the flames, and those who wanted America to join the bu bucket brigade of gasoline pourers were wrong. Um, I, I, I think that for several reasons the president was right not to engage militarily early on. Uh, for several reasons he was right. The first was that, number one, the US military did not want it. They could not afford it. If George Bush had not gone into Iraq, we might have been in a different position. But understand, do you know what the suicide rate for veterans is? 22 a day. Try to ingest that for a minute. We lose more veterans every year to suicide from post-traumatic shock than we did in the two wars, Iraq and Afghanistan combined. We had a very small number of people 
doing three, four, five tours of duty, seeing and doing things that they were absolutely unprepared to, to handle. I had a young nephew who went. He didn't really want to go. He joined the National Guard out of, out of, out of, uh, out of high school. And, uh, and then he got called up. He did it right after 9-11 in a patriotic fervor. Ended up as a prison guard. Um, he tried to kill himself. And he's still under, under, uh, you know, under treatment right now. And the damn shame is that the, the general, Shinseki, who was at the Pentagon when Rumsfeld was making the plans and who warned at Congress, I don't know if you remember this, General Shinseki went to Congress and said, it'll take 30, 355,000 troops. And he got fired from his job because Rumsfeld and, um, and what's his name? Um, no, um, Wolfowitz were saying 60 to 90,000 tops. And it'll be over in six months and we'll be out of there. And the Iraqis will pay for the rest of it with the oil money. That's what they were saying. And Shinseki said, that's nonsense. He got fired. And then Obama made him head of the VA. And actually, it got screwed up. Why? Because Congress appropriated the money. Didn't even appropriate the money. We spent the money on the war. We never appropriated it. This is a war that was never paid for. OK? We, all those guys came back, a couple million right now, veterans from those two wars. And there were no services for them because nobody increased the budget for the VA to deal with all the guys coming back. So poor Shinseki, he was right on the one end and he ended up with a job at the other end without the services to be able to provide for the guys who were coming back. And he got bounced from that job too. And so the generals are looking at this saying, we cannot afford another commitment. And, and you know, when people say, what, what? just do a no-fly zone. I sat down at the State Department with guys. I went over with folks from the Syrian opposition because I wanted to help them get access in the beginning when it was early. We went over, there was no fly zone. This isn't a video game. You know, we just do, 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 you know, and you zap them. It, they told us it would take between 50 to 70,000 troops to do a no fly zone and the humanitarian corridors that they were calling for. We did not have the manpower to do it, number one. And the country is war weary and it's wary of any further engagement. The military is, for, so that was one part of it. The other part of it was that it is a, it's not a situation where if you use overwhelming force, the other side says, oh, you're serious, we quit. The Russians just went in. Guess what? The Saudis say, screw you, we're gonna send more. And if the Saudis send more, the Iranians are gonna send more. And if the Iranians send more, then the Turks are gonna send more. And this is a continuing upward scale. You have 4 million refugees now, but you have 8 million internally displaced. This can get worse. If the conflict continues to heat up, more people will become refugees. There are no good guys. There are all a whole bunch of bad guys. And if America can't play the role of convener, which we haven't done, we have not used diplomatic muscle with our allies and even with the Iranians. Look, I thought the Iranian deal, I, I supported the president on it because I supported the president. It was an effort to do a, a negotiating to solve a problem. But I never thought the Iranian bomb was the thing we should be talking about with the Iranians. We should have been talking about their regional behavior. And we should be talking to our allies and the Iranians about the regional behavior. Because every conflict we have is one against the other. And if we do not peel that layer of the onion apart, these things are going to continue. And they're cropping up. We have proxy wars everywhere right now. And so what role for America? It's to try to play the adult. But we can't play the adult because we have a Congress that's stupid and a president who can't buck them. And he tries to buck them, but he, gets, he couldn't even close Guantanamo. They wouldn't let him do that. You know, the simplest thing that should have been the simplest thing, but the very first week out of the box, they blocked it with legislation. So I, I frankly think that, no, I, I can't imagine what more we could have done other than to pour more gasoline on the fire, provide more weapons or bombing raids or something like that. And it's going to backfire on whoever does it. At some point, people have to say, this madness must end. And it has to end in a negotiated solution that will not be perfect. We have that in Lebanon. I mean, God, the people in Lebanon who survived this, I don't mean the people who survived it, but the leaders who survived it, half of them should have gone to jail. But they didn't. I'm not saying this, look, I'm, I, I, I'm not saying this, to, I, I'm, I'm just telling you, you know, that look at the people who ended up in the government after, the, after Taif. They were combatants. 
Conflicts end with combatants in positions of power. That's how negotiated settlements end. You don't end up dissolving and destroying all signs. Or the, the, the Assad regime has to deal with the fact that the opposition is real and is not going away. And the opposition has to deal with the fact that the Assad regime is going to be there. They have to find a way to neuter each other and come to some agreement that works. It's not going to make anybody happy, but it's going to end the killing. And that's what has to happen, is we have to end the killing to give the people a chance to breathe. The problem is, at this point, Syria has become bigger than even the Civil War. It's become a permanent refugee and migration problem. We thought, in the beginning, everybody was dealing with this like a temporary issue. You know, they're out now, they'll go, they're not going anywhere. I've just been meeting with the Europeans on this. They have more than, you know, more than a million, maybe two million, they estimate now. It's going to be up to four or five million by the time it's over, refugees of all kinds. They're not going anywhere. There's not going to be a Donald Trump in Europe who's going to say, let's put them all on buses and ship them out. Europe will change dramatically in the next, in the next five to 10 years. They, they're going to come kicking and screaming into the 21st century. This idea of little ethnically pure states is over. I mean, the, the idea that you could be a, 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 a Kurd in Germany for three generations and still be a Turk, or a Pakistani in London for three generations and still be a Paki or an Algerian in France for three generations and still be Arab, that's over. They either have to get with the fact that you become French or become British or become German and they have to incorporate and change their whole national identity or they're screwed. And this is being forced upon them. They have to deal with it. Similarly, Lebanon has a million Syrian refugees. I know that the Lebanese recoil in horror when you say this. They're not going anywhere. We're going to be looking at this. I mean, I just want to be realistic about it. We're going to be looking at this 20 years from now. We're going to be saying, there's a million Syrians in Lebanon. Or there's going to be a million new Lebanese. It's going to be one or the other. We've tried to ignore reality for too long. We can't ignore that reality anymore. Life changes, countries change, reality changes. We have to deal with it. And so there is now a change taking place in the entire region that we have to accommodate. We have to somehow sit down. We need a conference 20 years down the road. Hadi al was here speaking earlier. I had a meeting with him uh, maybe about a year ago. One of the smartest things I, I had ever heard a leader say, as we finished our conversation, he was about to leave and he said, where do you think the region's going to be five years from now, 20 years from now? Let's talk about that. I said, that's the kind of conversation I want to have with an Arab leader. Who, instead of worrying about next week or this week, thinks 20 years down the road. And that's what we have to think. Let's have our vision of the Middle East 20 years down the road and say, what is going to happen? How do we get there? And what do we want it to look like? And the starting point has to be that what it's going to look like is not going to be what it was. Right? That's the point. It's going to change. What kind of change do we want and how do we, how do we become the midwives of that change to ease it forward? Listen, write to me. I, there's a lot more to say, I know, and I want to have this conversation. It's really important. Really important and I want to engage in it. So please write to me. My email is on the website uh, and I'd be very happy to have the conversation. Thank you all very much. <laughs>